to Knives Out is coming out very soon. Well, if it's anything like Knives Out, it's going to yeah. be absolutely wonderful. Yeah, that was perfect. So, we should be all I'm going to check in on YouTube, but otherwise, we should be. <laughs> second day of what thus far has been a really lovely workshop. I'm very happy that we've organized it. And uh, now we're going to be looking at physiological measures. And of course, the person who's going to be telling us about it is Martin Lang. And before he starts, I might mention that I was one of the examiners for his PhD. That's true. It was not a difficult decision. <laughs> Martin. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Conrad. And also thank you for your invitation and for organizing this beautiful workshop. I think it's been really useful. And it reminds me also of uh, our history because for me, I think it's now 10 years since I know you, since I was at your workshop in Kazimierz, mm -hmm. which was kind of like similar nature type of workshop. And I think some other people from here were there as well. So. I think it's beautiful that we have this 10 year anniversary and I can show you the, all the progress that we made through, during these 10 years in trying to you know, use physiological measures to tell us something about supernatural beliefs. And I think we can sum up all this progress in one slide. And uh, that's it. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Uh, so yeah, this is what I think now. Of course, I'm joking. Um, we know precisely what these measures can tell us. We can precisely localize supernatural beliefs in the brain. And um, no, so uh, obviously uh, it's somewhere in between, right? It's, it's much more complicated. And I will try to convey some of these complications today and really um, hopefully try to be a bit humble about these measures and place them somewhere where we can see they may be sometimes useful. But to give a bit of background about me, so why I'm talking about these measures. So I'm part of this uh, lab, which is called Laboratory for the Experimental Research of Religion. Shortly, Lavina, most of you probably know about us. Uh, it's a, we are a group of um, PhD students and, and academics, um, mostly using um, laboratory experiments to study religious beliefs and religious behaviors. We have a, a lab where we have uh, various uh, devices that, uh, that we use to uh, measure not only physiology but also some behavioral outputs. And we also have, a, a, or we, have, we uh, do a lot of research in Mauritius where we try to use these devices to measure behavior and physiology during real world occurring rituals. So this is going to be mostly work with, with Dimitris Xigalatas, with whom I, I presume most of you know uh, anyways. So uh, we do have some history in our lab of using these measures and I presume that's the reason why Conrad invited me to talk about them. So the, the actual question that I, I will be trying to answer in my talk is, uh, so how can we use these measures responsibly? Right, so without these exaggerated claims that you know, like they can, uh, lock, like we can localize uh, religious beliefs in the brain and so on. However, before I will be able to do that, um, I want to do a little digression uh, into the problem uh, of my identity, and you will be hijacked as my therapy group. Um, no, I'm joking. But the, the the problem I have with my identity is, so I'm officially a scholar of religion. But in my past, uh, I worked at psychology department, anthropology department, human evolutionary biology department. So it's pretty interdisciplinary. Uh, and I always struggled with trying to somehow put together the two identities, which would be you know, the, like the life sciences, the nature sciences identity, which would be you know, connected to these physiological measures, and then the humanities identity. So you know, I, during my undergraduate years, I was reading Michel Foucault and Talal Assad. And all these people, and you know, it left some mark on me. And 
So I do have this desire to try to, as much as this is possible, try to respect both sides of this debate. And it's difficult, you know, and you, you, we have this problem. We know about this problem for a long time, you know, it's the gap between the sciences and the humanities and the two cultures and so on and so on. Uh, and so what I would like to do first is to try to um, sketch some solution or a tool that I, I designed together with, with Radek Kunt, my colleague, how we can bridge this divide and how can we, where we can actually place these physiological measures. So I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, the type of approach that we developed in this paper, evolutionary cognitive and contextual approaches to the study of religious systems. And uh, sorry about this digression, but I think it's going to be useful in us understanding what these measures can, can really tell us. So in this paper, what we suggest is that the, the gap between the sciences and the humanities can be bridged by understanding religions as complex adaptive systems. Uh, this is mostly, this has been mostly inspired by the work of Rich Sources, who promotes this idea for, uh, for 15 years now, together with other people like Ben Pushitsky, and I joined, joined their camp happily because I think for me it makes a lot of sense. So what does it mean to say that religions are complex adaptive systems? Well, let's first forget about religion and let's first think about what are the complex adaptive systems. And I provide a brief definition here. So it's a collection of evolved behavioral patterns and associated cognitive mechanisms that interact in a nonlinear fashion and together can impact individual fitness. So the nonlinearities, right? So we have, uh, uh, so let's, let's first maybe talk about system, that, that, that's easier. So we have a, a collection of mechanisms and these mechanisms, like, like, you know, it can be a car, it can be even a technical system, but it can be also like a biological system. Sorry, it, it, you cannot really see it, but in the background there is, um, there is a human and inside in red there is um, a respiratory system. Right, so it's a collection of mechanism that allows us to breathe. And uh, the point here is that, you know, it's us as researchers who try to say, okay, this is a meaningful system that somehow works together. And we say, this is how it works and this is how the components are connected. And it's complex because these, um, the parts of the systems are not connected linearly. So the, the, these, their effects are not addict, uh, just simply additive but you know, they uh, can interact in uh, feedback loops and so on. So, this, this all so what this creates is a phenomena that we call, or phenomena that we often describe as emergence. And this is important for the debate with the humanities because this is often what, what at least I hear from my colleagues is that you, know, you cannot reduce this phenomenon that I am studying to this type of measures and so on and so on. And, and I agree to some extent. Of course we cannot because you know, we, need, we would need to understand really the complexity of it which is defined by, by all these interacting mechanisms in these nonlinear fashions. Now the third word I didn't talk about is that they are adaptive. So this provides us with some uh, time perspective. So these systems, they evolve, you know, so we can talk about uh, theories from cultural evolution, how this happens, and also from biological evolutions. But the, the point is that, you know, they impact fitness. So, so they impact how people reproduce and how they survive. And uh, so what the rich sources does with this is that he says, okay, so we can define some of the um, important elements of religion and see how they interact to impact individual fitness. And this is not really crucial for my talk, so I don't want to spend a whole time, like a bunch of time on this. But this is Sosis' scheme of how these religious systems work. So in the green rectangle, those are the main elements of, of the religious system and as he defines them. So you have supernatural agents, myth, sacred, taboos, and so on and so on. The crucial point here I think he's making is that for the system to work, however, you need an energy input into the system which is ritual. So through ritual, you know, we activate all these other elements of the system uh, because if you don't do anything, you know, it, it, like we know a lot about Roman religion, for example, but no one is performing their rituals. So, you know, the, the, the system has died. And what, he, what, what Sosis is doing here is that he's saying, okay, so, you know, all these interactions between these elements, they produce effects on the individual level, like on physiology, emotional, cognitive, 
blah, 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 and then on societal level in like cooperative and coordinated behavior. And if the system works well, you know, there is a positive feedback loop, new, new people are coming in. If it doesn't work well, you know, there is a negative feedback loop and the system dies or reforms. So, so this is on a societal level, the type of thinking about complex adaptive system. But what I'm trying to do now, or what we did in the paper, is to say this is really useful to also to think about uh, the systemic properties of individual, right? of individual minds, of individual physiology, and how can we combine them uh, with what we study in the humanities, which is you know, like culture, and cultural beliefs and cultural behaviors, religious beliefs and religious behaviors. And uh, we designed, uh, and this is really a, a tool for me that I try to use in my research. We designed this, this 3D cube uh, that should help us to orient ourselves on where we are in our research and what we can really tell from the methods that we use. So notice that we have three axes here. Uh, I think the, the, the easiest to start with is what, what I call here contextual width. So let's say we have a specific phenomenon that we observed, you know, some type of ritual behavior at this moment. And this will be very cultural specific. This will be specific for one group. But then we can go along this axis towards universality and try to say something very broad about rituals in general, right? So this is, this is just moving along this axis. Along the temporal depth axis, again, we can study, you know, ritual that is uh, happening right now study its history, and go deeper and deeper, you know, into like deeper evolutionary time. And then the third axis, which would be the most relevant for us today is the mechanistic axis. So again, we have a phenomenon and we can start to disentangle this phenomenon into the individual mechanisms and their interactions that produce this phenomenon. So this will be mostly what I guess uh, scholars in the cognitive sciences of religion try to do. Uh, to give you a um, more specific example that we also provide in this paper is um, it's a ritual that we study in Mauritius. It's a type of some um, Just a bit of, it's morning, it's early morning, sensitivity warning. Uh, there are some needles. If you don't like pierced people, just don't look away, but it's not that bad. It's not that bad. So what is type of some in Mauritius? Uh, it's an annual ritual, it's a procession where people first gather at one temple and they bring these, uh, sorry, it's a bit fast, let's try to do it again. They bring these structures that are called cavities that they carry throughout the procession, but they also uh, pierce their bodies with sometimes hundreds of needles and these huge skewers, and then walk pierced uh, around six kilometers to another temple. And uh, so what we can do here uh, with this ritual is to say, okay, so we studied this ritual at year 2018, or I was there, 2016. Uh, I took these pictures and this is what happened. So yeah, so people do crazy stuff. They drag these chariots. And uh, I will be talking about this, this ritual a bit more. So that's why I chose this as, a, as an example here. And it's really intense and I can say, okay, so this is what we want to study. This is the, 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 the phenomenon that we observed at this particular moment. But then uh, if you imagine the cube, you know, we can slide, uh, we can start sliding on the contextual bit and say, well, how this ritual looks in different Mauritian cities and different Mauritian Tamil communities. And you know, like it will be a bit different. And we can go further on the contextual bit axis and say, well, how does this work in different Tamil communities around the world, let's say in Thailand. And you know, we see it's a bit different. They use uh, you know, different skewers, different type of processions. And on the like, uh, universality axis, we can look at other, what we would call extreme rituals. You know, so like uh, the Aboriginal uh, scarifications, or you know, everyone knows this picture, fire walking in Spain, for example, and try to look for common um, uh, common components of these, these rituals. And uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's really only when we are here at the universality uh, uh, place of the scale so that we can start to think about these mechanisms. Well, 
not really, but it's, it's usually where we start to think about it because that's where we can um, manage the complexity into a reasonable number of mechanisms that we can start to uh, investigate. Uh, but uh, before going there, I forgot I want to show you one, one more thing. Is just, I ignore the temporal depth. But we can also ask questions about temporal depth. So I was sliding on the contextual width. But if you slide on the temporal depth, we can ask questions like, you know, what was, like, what's the history of the performance of the Kavadi ritual in Katerborn, which was the city, and in this Kobel temple? And, you know, we can think about, okay, so in 1941, you know, the first um, uh, Kavadi ritual was commenced in this temple, and how did it affect the actual phenomenon that we observed in this year 2016? And we can go even, oh yeah, so that, that's, that's, I'm not sure if this is from the 1941, but it's one of the first Kavadis performed there. And we can go even deeper and think about, uh, you know, the Tamil community when they first arrived to Mauritius, what type of customs they brought with themselves, and again, how did it affect the phenomenon that we observed? And we can combine sliding on these two axes, which is the thing I like about it, and say, okay, so we have this, um, uh, this ritual, this type of some that is performed across the world. So again, we can now start sliding on the you know history axis and see how did this ritual come about. And you know we have some myth about this Ashura Induban who was carrying these two mountains and met the god Muruga who killed him, but then told him that you know if he's going to serve him, he will just uh, make him alive again and blah blah blah. And that, that's what, where we have like this tradition of carrying. These, these burdens, as they call this, these cavities on their shoulders. And again, we can start thinking, how does it impact the phenomenon that we observed? And then if we move to the universal side of this cube and go into the temporal depth, that's the place where we can start uh, asking the evolutionary questions. So why do we have these extreme rituals? And you know what? One of the answers, and I'm not particularly attached to this answer, but let's see one of the answers might be, well, it's because they generate uh, an effect on social bonding. So they bring people together, right? So people like Harry Whitehouse or Dimitris as well made these claims, you know, these shared dysphoric experiences bring people together. And we may, uh, you know, we may go into the evolutionary history and see what would be the selection pressures on evo like the evolution of this particular type of behavior, and when did when it could happen? So there was a really long uh, digression to get uh, at the physiological measures because now we're going further with this example, we can start asking: Okay, so we have this effect on social bonding. So how this is mechanistically uh, facilitated? Right? And one of the mechanisms, among others, we can look at is pain. So these extreme rituals, they often share uh, the, the like similar component, which is people suffer some pain. And in this research by Bastian and Collective, what they show is that they, this is a lab experiment. They had three groups, uh, sorry, three experiments. Uh, and each of these experiments, they had two groups. And one of the groups suffered some pain treatment. So either they had to have their hands in cold water, or they had to do this squat thing that for, I don't know, like three minutes or something, and or they ate a chili pepper. And then Bastian and colleagues look at the social bonding and they found that, you know, that these groups that performed these painful things together were more bonded together. So nice, it looks like, you know, we are starting to understand how this presumed bonding effect of this extreme ritual is facilitated, but we can go even deeper, right? We can go into uh, deeper mechanisms and look at how, why pain should have these effects. And we can start to talk about the endogenous opioid system that we have in our bodies, you know, which produces beta endorphins. And beta endorphins, th those are um, natural analgesic, so they help us to block pain. But they also have these, uh, because they are opioids, they also have these effects on social bonding. And you may know this from, uh, you know, terms like the runner's high. So, you know, if you run for a really long time, endorphins are produced in your body and then you have this rush. And uh, so, and there, there is some research, and I will talk about this a bit more, that shows that it's really endorphins facilitating this social bonding. 
And what I like about this 3D cube again is that, again, it's at this point where we can decide, well, let's look at the evolutionary history of endorphins, right? And why endorphins should have this function. And this is, you know, mostly, of course, the work of Robin Dunbar, who claims that, you know, endorphins are, you know, the, mo the more, most important mechanism used for social bonding in other primate species. So we may presume that, you know, our hominin and hominid ancestors would use, you know, social grooming that produces endorphins as this uh, basic bonding mechanism. So the point is, um, if you want to use physiological measures, you need to be sure, do we have some pointer or something? Because it's pretty high and I'd like to point. <laughs> no, sorry, I usually have mine, but I didn't take it. Well, anyway, so let me just be trying to, well, so where we are really with physiological measures on this 3D cube is somewhere here, right? So it's not, so it's important to understand that, you know, these physi physiological measures are not gonna help us to really understand number one over there, you know, the specific phenomenon. It's gonna help us to understand some tiny part of that. But we are mostly talking about, you know, some of these like really universal features which are very broad and very vague, and which are mostly uninteresting for people in the humanities. And, you know, that's okay. What would be really cool to do, and, you know, where we should try to move the field forward, I think is try to go with, you know, understanding the mechanistic compositions of this religious system and try to get more closer to the specific systems. Which basically means that we need to understand, you know, a lot more about the specific, like the, the mechanistic complexity is basically rising, you know, getting here. And we can't really study this experimentally anymore. It's mostly, you know, work for computer simulations where we can start putting all these factors that we think are in play, you know, including the history of the specific systems uh, into this model and see whether we can you know, tr explain some of these cultural specific phenomena. But this is really not the place for physiological measures. So what is the place? Uh, here is a programmatic statement that I quite like from um, Pierre Lienard and Pascal Boyer, one of the you know, formative figures of the early cognitive science of religion. And they say that, they say this specifically about ritual, but I will get to supernatural beliefs. Ritual performances produce specific effects in participants that result in subsequent performance. So they say, we must document those cognitive systems most likely to be activated by ritual performance and gather independent evidence on the effect of such activation. So basically they are saying, you know, if people do something like they participate in some ritual, it should have some effects, right? And it, these effects should be mediated or facilitated by some mechanisms. So we want to document both these effects and the mechanism to understand how they work. So in some respect, you can think about this as, as what we talked about yesterday about uh, convergent validity, right? So we want to know that uh, the, the, if um, our measures, and in this case physiological measures, uh, are useful, you know, we should be documenting, or they can help us to document these, these effects that rituals supposedly should have on the physiological level. Let me give you an example. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's been pretty much documented by a lot of studies that people around the world in different occasions and, you know, ritual gatherings would be one of them, move in synchrony. You know, it can be dancing, it can be marching and so on, or praying together in synchrony. And Again, this is mostly the work of the group around Robin Dunbar. Uh, it has been suggested that synchrony produces the social bonding effects. And that specifically it's the endorphins, you know, that synchrony being in synchrony with other people, you know, activates the endorphin system that, that creates these bonding effects. There has been other suggestions about different mechanisms, uh, which relates to um, self-other overlap. So the idea there is that you know, the, the way our brains understand other people's intentions uh, is that, you know, we see, uh, let me give a more specific example. I see, I, will take Conrad, I see what Conrad is doing and I will simulate it onto my own motor network and then think, well, it's more automatic and then think, okay, he's doing this because if I would be in his position, I would do this. So that's why I think he's doing that. 
And because in synchrony, if Konrad is doing the, exactly the same thing as I am doing, now there is some kind of blurring between me and Konrad, that, that's how the, the theory goes, which creates in me the feeling that I'm closer to Konrad, right? So there's the social bonding. So it's one mechanism. The other mechanism suggested is that uh, being in synchrony is actually very natural for us, and it's really difficult to be in, in asynchrony with someone, you know? So we have these studies like people in rocking chairs, spontaneously rocking in the same tempo, or, or clapping, and so on. So the idea here is that because synchrony is so easy for us and so natural, it's a very, very um, easy thing to do for a collective of people, and it creates a feeling that we cooperated cooperated together. So we did something together that, which was successful, and this then translates into our feeling of being bonded with other people. And finally, we have the endorphin mechanism. So what we, you know, in line with uh, uh, Leonard's and Boyer's suggestion, what we try to do is to say, okay, so we have rituals, they often have these, these uh, elements of synchrony, and so first, do these, do these synchronous behaviors have some effects, and second, what are the mechanisms that facilitate these effects? And the way we try to answer this question is that we invited individual participants into our lab and uh, we gave them a task to move into a beat that they heard, uh, do a specific movement. Vlado is here, Vlado was one of the main um, designers of this study. And uh, what we asked them to do was uh, to make a type of movements with their hands to the beat. And we had three conditions, so our participants were randomly assigned to one of these conditions. Uh, um, sorry, forgot to say one thing. And they were asked to synchronize with other person, but the other person wasn't in the room. It was a video transmission. So we said this person is in another room, and you know the, the, our participants saw like a video projection on the wall, and we told them that they are being uh, videotaped, and the other person is seeing their projection as well. As a matter of fact, this was a pre-recorded video of our colleague uh, who, uh, in one video, he made the exact movements as, was, as he was supposed to do, so you know, he would be in synchrony with participants. In the other video, which we call low synchrony, he made mistakes and, and um, you know, wasn't really in the tempo, and then we had a control condition where people would be performing these movements uh, you know, in front of a blank wall. And what we wanted to really see is what's the difference between this condition and you know, hypothesizing that we should see the effect uh, in the high synchrony condition. So first question was, would synchrony activate the mechanisms that you know, were hypothesized in the literature? And uh, yes, it did. Uh, if you look at so self other overlap uh, measured with these overlapping circles like the identity fusion, we do see it's higher in the high synchrony condition perceived cooperation higher in the uh, high synchrony condition. And then uh, pain threshold, uh, forgot to say this, pain threshold, we use it as a proxy for the endorphin release. As I said, you know, endorphins are analgesic. So basically, more, the more people um, endure pain, the more uh, pain they could endure, it's a proxy for like a higher level of uh, beta endorphins in their blood. And again, we do see that, you know, through, throughout our treatment, uh, the pain threshold increased in the high sync condition while it didn't in the other two conditions. So great, so synchrony did actually um, activate all these three mechanisms, but what's the effect you know, of these mechanisms on actual social bonding, or in this case, we measured trust. How did we measure trust? Using an economic game, which is called the trust game. Uh, how does it work? Very briefly. So we have a person A who is the truster, so in this case that would be our participant, and he got some sum of money, let's say five euros. And he can decide, or she can decide, whatever portion of that money they would send to player B. And whatever portion is being sent, it's tripled, and so then player B gets triple of that. So in this case, you know, person A decides to send three euros. Sorry, it's you know, tripled, so person B gets nine euros. And then person B can decide how much of that nine euros, or whatever you know, they get, would send back. So the point here is that if player A really trusts player B, you know, they would send all of the money and together they would earn the most. But if player A doesn't trust player B, you know, they would still, they would send nothing. 
So, so you know, in this case, trust would really uh, help both of them, but distrust doesn't. Uh, so the question for us was, would um, synchrony facilitate trust? And uh, it's, sorry, that's one of the questions. The second one was, we also measured likability of, of you know, this confederate, our colleague. And so we did see that, again, high synchrony, the, the other person was more likable, but I think more importantly, people would also trust you know, our colleague more with their money in the trust game. So hooray. And finally, here is mediation analysis, which I think is really interesting, because what we show here is that the monetary investment in the trust game was uh, mediated by the pain threshold. So it wasn't really mediated by what people reported in their, you know, in the questionnaires about likability, about how the well they cooperated, about self other overlap. It was really the endorphin mechanism as suggested. So great, interesting. Um, however, you know, this is a ritual behavior, right? This, we are still talking about rituals. But the question we want to ask here today is, so what can this measure tell us about belief? And you know, I don't want to put up the black slide again, but um, <laughs> it's going to be more difficult, let's say. So because, you know, let's try to reformulate this Leonard and Boyer's um, suggestion and say, OK, so supernatural beliefs produce specific effects in participants that result in subsequent performance. You know, so we must document these systems, blah, 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 to be activated, that are activated by supernatural beliefs and gather independent evidence of such activation. Now, this gets a bit more tricky because uh, do we really think that just belief itself produces some effects in participants that result in some performance? I don't know. <laughs> it's, you know, it's difficult for me to imagine that I would be just sitting and, you know, contemplating my belief and suddenly that's going to, you know, trigger a cascade in my body that's going to have some meaningful effects. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, this is open for discussion, of course, but, you know, let, 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 let's, I would like to hear what you think, but this is like a, the first uh, barrier that I have here. Uh, and this is to say, you know, so what can this measure tell us about belief? Well, perhaps nothing, and, you know, it's fine with me. Like, I don't mind. Uh, I don't need to claim that these, these, you should all use these measures because they are just so great and they can help us explain so many things. Well, they don't. And it's fine, you know, it's just, we don't need to. And also, uh, the point here is that I'm fine just, you know, uh, looking at uh, like the lower level of, of, um, of the, you know, the human organism and the human psychology and, and see how they work at the lower levels, even though it doesn't really help us explain that much on the, you know, higher level of like religious cognition or religious beliefs. But, uh, I understand this is unsatisfactory answer. Uh, so, you know, if you would really hard press me and tell, well, tell us something. How can we use this? Tell us something. Well, I would say perhaps those measures can tell us something about commitment to supernatural agents. Why commitment? So uh, we had discussions yesterday about the use of, of uh, scales and self-reports and you know how those self-reports may be biased sometimes and this was mostly manifested in in Will Gervais's talk you know who tried to circumvent the self-report bias by you know suggesting other other methods like the IAT or, or whatever the other methods were called I forgot and uh, this so this would be a, like a similar idea uh, why well um, th this is a a graph from a, a paper that we have with John Shaver, and John Shaver really did all the work here. So what's this graph showing us? So this is um, from field work that John Shaver did in Fiji uh, in a small village. And I think across three months, what he did was that he went to every church service and recorded every person who took part in the church service. And then after three months, you know, he asked people, how often do you participate in rituals? Uh, how religious are you? And he also gathered um, data on religious reputation from the community. So he would ask people, so who is the most religious in your community and so on. And what we did here is that we tried to predict based on the self-reports the actual you know, probability of the actual performance. And on, on the plot B, what we do see is that 
there, there is some correlation, but it's pretty weak. And you know, there is obviously there is a problem with our measurement because uh, on the lower uh, portion of the graphs there is a histogram, and you know we do see that people just score on the three and four and five. And so there is really very low variability, and it's probably part of the reason why the correlation is so low. We are doing a bit better with religiosity, but again, like the, the, the span of the data is pretty limited here. And actually, the best measure that we found to, you know, to be the best predictor of actual attendance is religious reputation. You know, and for me, it kind of makes sense is that you know, people tend to sometimes over-report you know, the, 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 um, uh, the questions or the items that uh, are desirable, and, but we do see that the community keeps track very well of you know, who is doing what. So the, the, um, the point here is that, well, maybe we could use these physio physiological measures instead of self-reports to get at actual people's commitment. You know? So it's not like they just say that they believe something, but I really want to know how strongly they believe. You know? So how different is it if someone says, I believe, nine out of 10 and someone says, I believe six out of 10. You know, can we actually see this in the physiological, on the physiological level? You know, can we get, uh, let's say, either a confirmation or maybe a more precise data from physiology? And um, this is something I have never done, just to be honest, like I don't know, but uh, I will try to show you how we could do it on data that we have. And those data come uh, from uh, a study uh, led by Dimitris uh, which has been published in current anthropology. And this is really a study about something else. It's about, again, type of some, uh, this is Sitterae cavity. It's a similar, um, similar extreme ritual in Mauritius. But we looked here at psychophysiological well-being. So the effects of this ritual on, on, on well-being. Uh, and uh, just briefly, what we tried to do is to see, we had two groups. Uh, so control group. And uh, so people who didn't take part in the ritual and people who did par take part in the ritual. And this was a pretty intensive study. So it, the study took six weeks. We uh, measured two groups. It was always one week measurements. And uh, so it was before the Kavadi, during the Kavadi week, and afterwards. And uh, what we assessed here, uh, we used these, these devices, which are called sensor badges, which are uh, worn here uh, on the left hand. And they can be born constantly. Uh, just to remind you, I think we collected this data to 2014. So it was really before the boom of these um, activity trackers. And you know, all of us probably have them. I don't have my watch on my hand right now. But I mean, it, it's much better than, than that nowadays. It could be actually much easier to do it. But anyway, this is what we had back then. And these measures, uh, they are really they're, Mostly these devices were used by uh, medical professionals uh, for obese people to you know, monitor their activity, how much they uh, move, how, mu how much uh, energy they spend, how much they sweat. It also measures sleep efficiency. And beside that, we also measured people's heart rate. And you know, once per week, we would ask them about their perceived quality of life and self-assessed health. And we wanted to see how uh, participating in this ritual affects these measures. Because quite counterintuitively, a lot of the ritual participants would tell us that actually they participate in this ritual because you know, they are sick, they are ill, they have some chronic illness. And this is the mean for them to heal themselves, which you know, looks, at least, at least to me, is, it's kind of strange. Uh, so we wanted to look deeper into this. Uh, and what we found, though, was that on the physiological measures, we didn't see any difference pre to post ritual between the two groups. And this is perhaps because these measures were quite noisy. Uh, but we did see a positive difference in the self-reported measures. So people who did take part in the ritual felt better afterwards, you know, the, the week after. So f felt more healthy and that their quality of life increased. Nice, but that's not the point here. The point is that we do have these physiological measures of participating in Kaladi which is fantastic, and I think you know, that's pretty unique data. And this is just to show you how it looks like. Uh, uh, so here on the top, top right graph, what we see is on the y-axis, it's Calvin screen response, so it's how much people sweat. Uh, this is being used as a proxy for stress levels. And on the x-axis, we have uh, time, so this is the, the ritual day, this is the Kavadi day. And uh, uh, sorry, Kavadi day, <laughs> this is a Kavadi day for the red lines. 
and the green lights are average days of our participants in this time window of the day. And so we do see that, uh, you know, the Kaladi was pretty st stressful for a lot of people, those are averages, and also that the energy expenditure, this is uh, calories per minute, uh, are rising, are pretty high during the ritual. Uh, so what we could do here is to say, well, can we use those measures that we obtained during Kavadi to get at people's commitment? And, you know, I have these two anonymous participants that I, I, I took from our data and say, well, you know, compare these measurements. And maybe we can say that this participant has lower commitment because before the Kavadi, you know, he actually slept for five hours. He took part, like the, the really high arousing part of the Kaudi was one and a half hours. He spent around 2,000 kilojoules, and you know, he carried one Kaudi and had one needle. And uh, in comparison, this highly committed participant, he didn't sleep before the Kaudi. It took him four and a half hours of like really intense physical activity. During the ritual, you know, you see the spent energy is much higher. And also, you know, he would have, uh, uh, apart from all these needles, he would also drag this, this chariot, or, or I have it as a trailer here. So nice, uh, this looks pretty convincing. I guess we should agree that, you know, this, this participant really looks like, you know, he's more committed to his belief. So uh, I forgot to say that, you know, this, um, this ritual is commissioned uh, to uh, appease the god Muruga. Uh, so we would say, okay, this person is more committed to Muruga than that person on the left. And you can say, hey, Martin, but why we should use these fancy devices? I mean, we can see it even without and just look at, at you know, the number of needles and you know, the time that people spend, like we don't need to use their physiology, measure their physiology, and I would say, Yes, <laughs> you're right. Uh, but we can think about maybe other like less extreme rituals, right? So we can think about, I don't know, Catholic mass and you know, measure some you know, physiological reactions of people uh, during the Catholic mass where they are mostly seated and the movement is limited. And perhaps you know, we could think, well, some people are more emotionally invested and that should manifest in their physiology. And you know, this is something that we couldn't really measure without this, this, this physiological device, this device that measure physiological reaction. So perhaps this, uh, this is a way to measure commitment. Uh, although I think we are getting to the same point where we get um, yesterday with the IAT measures, which is, you know, this is a scene from Blade Runner, the movie, uh, it's, uh, which is based on Philip K. Dick um, book, To Android Dream of Electric Sheep. And so here we have Android, and uh, for those who don't know this movie, is that they have this special device that measures, you know, like um, emotional reactions of these people to uh, questions. I think, like, you know, like if if they would react to torturing some animals and so on. I don't recall exactly. And they, they would measure, you know, like their reactions, and based on this, they would assess whether those are actual humans or androids. And so this is just a warning that I don't think our measures have this diagnostic capacity. And you know, this, this is the, the lie, lie, lie detector all over again, which was based on physiology, right? This was based on galvanic skin response and how people sweat during their answers. So, so I, I don't know. And to give you a bit more uncertainty, it appears with this distinction that I made before, the joke is on me, uh, because this is another paper of ours where we show uh, how people participate in this ritual. And that actually the, the way they participate doesn't need to reflect their commitment, but mostly their social status. So what we have in these graphs, and you know, we can just look at the top one, which is piercing, and just let's focus on males because that's um, more uh, appropriate here because males engage in these uh, higher or, or dealer rituals. And we see that, oh, sorry, no, we need to look at those, sorry. But let's look at males now. So in the number of piercings, we do see is that if we divide people on the, uh, according to their social status, which would be their, uh, the prestige of their occupation, education, and so on, uh, the, and on the x-axis, we have um, how, on average, how people, how often they take part in the ritual, which you know, would be like a different way to assess their commitment throughout the year. We do see that the more committed people are in the low status 
category, the more piercings they would have during the hypersum cavity. But it's absolutely not true for the high social status people because for them, uh, they actually despise it, you know, they, which doesn't mean that they are less committed. You know, they just, it's just, uh, those people are usually, the, the high status people are usually walking in front of the procession, they usually have just one needle and they don't take part in this extreme stuff. But doesn't mean they are less, they are, uh, less committed, not necessarily, because if you look at, at cavity volume, we do see that these, these people have you know, larger cavities. They are carried, so cavity is this, this structure that they carry. And uh, one explanation that we try to provide in this paper, why is this the case, is that why they can have you know, larger cavities is because they can use more expensive materials that are actually cheaper. So they can build larger cavities and still carry them and they are gonna be actually more, lighter. more li yeah, lighter. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so the distinction that I tried to make before uh, with this, you know, commitment, uh, people. Well, I don't think it holds. I, you know, I think we would really need to think that what I said is low committed person. It's actually maybe high status person, which is actually really committed. So how we are doing on time? Okay. Uh, if I haven't uh, persuaded you that you shouldn't use these measures, um, then let's look at those measures actually. And uh, these are some of the devices that I used. And, uh, I decided it doesn't make really sense to you know, go through each of these devices and tell you all the details because it would be just overwhelming. I don't think you would get much out of it. I'm happy to talk about any of these devices if someone of you would be interested. But just to give you a brief overview, what these are. So I talked a bit about the, the top the left one, which is the Sensefire batch that we used in Mauritius. Uh, so we get you know, things like activity, movement, uh, governing skin response, uh, sleep efficiency. They don't pr produce them anymore, but you know, we can have these activity trackers which are actually better. The sense, uh, so sociometric batch, which is the blue, uh, oh my God, white thing over there. Uh, this is an interesting device produced by MIT. Uh, this is not a really uh, measuring any physiology. This is a behavioral <coughs> measuring uh, device. And what it does is that it measures proximity. So basically people have, like a group of people have these devices on, on lanyards, on their necks, and uh, you know, it can measure dynamically how people get close to each other, whether they face to each other. It also measures uh, how much people talk to each other, uh, you know, how they take turns in discussions and so on. So a lot of these like uh, softer social metrics, uh, which can assess, you know, like we try to use it as an assessment of group cohesion. Uh, then uh, here we have a, a biopack, which is like a really, a uh, huge company, it's a standard company that produces these, these uh, various physiological measures. Uh, so this would be a, a laboratory-based equipment uh, that we have at, at, at Levina. And uh, basically what it allows you to do is it's modular. So you can attach different modules that, you know, that are used to uh, measure different things, like for example, galvanic skin response, like uh, pulse rate, or things like EMG, which is the movement of your muscles, or FNIRS, and uh, all these devices. Just to, uh, I have an example here. So this is, this is one of the devices that we used. So it's really nice because it's mobile, so you know, you can attach it like this. Here we would use it to measure uh, galvanic skin response on, on fingers and pulse. So then people can actually move a bit with this device and they don't have to be you know, strictly attached to cables. Uh, this is uh, the paint ridge hold measure, algometer. So this is what we used, in, well, we used in the synchrony uh, uh, study, a bit different one. But this is generally how it looks like. So the idea is that, you know, you have to find a specific spots, uh, for example, on your palm. So we, uh, in different experiments, we use this spot. And basically, you apply pressure to this spot and people have to tell you, stop whenever they start feeling pain. And then, you know, you have like an exact measurement of the pressure that, that you used. This is um, a heart rate monitor. So here, heart rate, uh, we would use mostly a measure of heart rate variability, uh, which is uh, if you, uh, very simply, if you um, imagine, well, heart rate is basically how often your, your heart beats per one minute. Heart rate variability is if you take those beats and look at the time difference between the two beats, and then see how this time difference varies during a specific window, for example, one minute. And this is a bit more sensitive measure to assess uh, variables like stress or negative effect. Uh, 
And you know, it can be decomposed a bit more into high frequency, low frequency, which you know should then be a proxy for different psychological processes. And that's still you know, like area of, of investigation, so it's a bit controversial, but you know, you can do these things. And finally, this, these are called actigraphs, and basically they just measure acceleration. So those are accelerometers, useful to measure movement. Uh, so uh, you know, like we at, would at, at, attach these to people's uh, wrists, and then see, for example, during rituals, how they move and whether they move in some specific patterns. So again, a way to quantify their movement. Uh, so this would be a very brief overview. Uh, this is, it's the same thing here in text. Uh, this is what I use, so if any of that is of interest to you, uh, please get in touch with me and I can tell you a bit more uh, how you know, we can use all these measures. I didn't talk about hormones, but that's, I mean, I'm not too experienced with them, so. Uh, but I have some opinions, if you're interested. Uh, to sum up, so. What would be the benefits of using these measures? Well, there are some. Uh, for example, you can measure unobservable variables, right? So, uh, you know, heart rate, uh, how much people sweat, and so on. It's, you know, if you, if you believe that these variables measure some processes in the body or in, in psychology that we are interested in, fine, you know, th it's difficult to get at those variables in a different way. What's really nice is, I call it, it's, here it's fast, but uh, what I mean here is that, you know, sometimes, like during a ritual, you cannot stop people from doing what they are doing and ask them a question, right? But if you have a device, you know, that is measuring constantly what they are doing, they, don't, they can just do whatever they are doing otherwise. And, you know, you still get the measurement throughout all their activities. So you don't need to bother people. And this can be also used in laboratory designs. So this is really a huge advantage, is that, you know, especially if the device is uh, really small so people can forget about it, this is cool. I don't, I don't remember what I want to say that it's practical. Um, so let's keep that. It's innovative, uh, so, you know, if we want our science to go forward, you know, th this is interesting, right? It's, it's easy, it's sexy to use those measures, so uh, as much as this is an advantage, but it's true, like journals like this, um, if we are careful with our inferences, you know, we can provide some innovative uh, insights. Uh, it's quantitative, obviously. Um, it's rich with data, so this is interesting. Uh, and I do have it also in, in the cons section. Uh, so we can measure a lot these days, like hundreds of variables with one device. And so we can get, you know, like very easily during the day, like hundreds of thousands of data points. Um, which is on one side is great, uh, you know, so it gives you a lot of opportunities uh, which you can do with this data and it's really easy to collect these data nowadays. But what you should do with these data, that's, that's, that's the problem then. Uh, it's recorded, so you know, so uh, as much as your recording procedure is fine, uh, it's great that you have all these data um, are pretty much already digitalized and uh, they are usually very precise. So, you know, you can use these measures to measure processes uh, you know, which with precision like one measurement. Well, so the frequency would be like two thousands per second, for example, two thousand measurements per second. Extreme precision. Uh, but what are the costs? So, well, it's expensive. Uh, some of these devices can really be expensive. So the biopack that's that's going to be uh, like the whole setup around ten, fifteen thousand euros, dollars. It's the same now. Uh, not the small ones, it's a bit cheaper, but it still costs money. Uh, I think the bigger barrier though is that, and this is really important, this goes back to, to my 3D cube. So like you need to understand physiology and this is, I mean, I don't, I would like to understand it actually a bit more and I don't feel too proficient in that. So you need to be able to connect the data that you have, you know, with these higher dimensions that you are trying to talk to. And this is no small feat and you know, like the whole field of biological psychology <laughs> is struggling with that. Like what, you know, these data from heritage variability, for galvanic synthesis response, what, like what type of 
psychological processes it actually tracks? It's not very easy question to answer. Uh, and you know, on our part as researchers, of course, like you can say, well, so why don't we just work with people who understand physiology? And I would say, yes, that's the way to go. However, in my experience, and this is like a general point about interdisciplinarity, is that I often find that you know, if I don't know how these measures work and what type of data they can provide us, I don't know what type of questions I can ask those measures. So it's not that easy to work with someone who speaks different language, who has like completely different ideas about research questions, about these measures. It's usually what I found the easiest is just to learn those myself, which is of course time consuming and you know, I might be better spending the time on something else. Uh, you need some technical skills uh, with handling uh, these devices. So you know, to uh, assure measurement precision, uh, you need to fit those devices, you need to you know, use some protocols, uh, how to operate them. So, you know, it's, it helps to be tech savvy here. Uh, well, and then there's uh, the whole thing with signal processing. So, you know, I told you, like, you can get hundreds of thousands of data points, but you need to clean them somehow. You need to make sure that, you know, they're reliable. And this is pretty difficult. Uh, and, you know, there are some standard procedures to, to do that, uh, but y you need to know programming, basically. I use MATLAB for that, you can use Python. And nowadays you can also use R, but you need to have some serious programming skills to do that. And I'm not patting myself on the shoulder here, sorry, but I mean, it's, it's a fact, like you, you need to know, know these things. Uh, and uh, the other cost, I think, or disadvantage from the scientific point of view here is that in the signal processing, there is a lot of degrees of freedom that the researcher has to make a lot of decisions on parameters. You know, the way you set up the, the cleaning procedures and which, like, a, I think I have an example here, uh, yes. So, so this would be data from the accelerometers, you know, and there are problems with these data. So like, uh, I want to measure people's movements, but sometimes like if like someone is doing, you know, has a like, slight tremor, it's gonna massively bias the data. So I need to clean this tremor, and I need to set up parameters like what I would say is tremor and what is not a tremor. And after I clean it, I also wanted to smooth it to, you know, so it would be easier for me to select what is a movement and what is not a movement. And, uh, you know, all, in all this, there's a lot of degrees of freedom I'm using on this research. And of course, I document, you know, my decisions and my rationale for making all these, setting up all these parameters. But it is what it is. You know, compared to psychological measures and scales and so on, it, there is definitely this problem is much, much larger here. Um, I talked about multiple measures, right? So, so I said that it's a benefit, but it's also a cost because I, I don't know what to do with all these measures. Uh, and the problem is that sometimes, you know, they don't agree with each other. And what you do then? Like, I don't really have a good solution to that other than think about some um, machine learning approaches, you know, where we can, uh, this, this is something that I would like to do in the future. So, you know, if you have, let's say, 200 variables that some of these devices produce, you can use machine learning procedures, you know, to select, basically, like it's a, it's a three decision algorithms, to select some of these variables that are the most important and then just work with those. It's one of the solutions, but it's probably not a, not a great solution. Uh, sometimes these uh, devices can be intrusive. Um, we, like, especially in our field studies, we try not to, um, use those, but you know, like the, in the cavity study, we use these, these sensor badges, and there actually may be, um, just another cost, there may be ethical concerns, like, you know, like do we want to put those devices on people during uh, uh, activities that are sacred for them, that are really important for them? You know, so the way we do did this, is like we of course explain it to the participants why we are doing this, what we are measuring, and we also, if you see that, so we provided them with these uh, red scarves that they could, could use to put, uh, to cover these devices, and this is like a typical thing they would put on their hands anyways. So I think this was a pretty neat solution, you know, kind of that Dimitris came up with. Uh, but, you know, like, uh, there are some ethical concerns and uh, also like what would be the benefits for people to doing this and like here, for example, in this case, uh, these devices produce something like a, like a report 
for people. So we gave those reports to people so they could take it to their doctors, for example, you know, from this like one week measurement. So there, there are ways to counter that, but, but it's always uh, gonna be a, a concern here. So it's mostly it on my part. Uh, so I started to ask with the question like, does, do, so does it make sense to use these measures in the study of supernatural beliefs? Is it worth it? Uh, I guess you felt skepticism on my part. I am skeptic, but I'm not, I don't think it's hopeless, but I think it's you know, up to our discussion right now to see you know, whether we may come up with some better ideas how to use these measures. Thank you. Okay, um, we're supposed to be having a coffee break right now, um, and Robin's nodding at me. <laughs> uh, so perhaps what we could do is we could quickly grab some coffee, uh, some of us, that those that want it, and come back earlier and have the discussion right after the coffee. And also, you can bring all food and drinks inside, it's no problem, don't worry about it. All right, so let's do that. Let's grab the coffees and those who are hungry, grab the food and come back here and have a discussion session. Will you uh, keep this on so we can have the discussion? I think let's do that. Okay, I will leave So those people who are watching on the internet, go and grab the coffee. <laughs> No. No. So I'm going to have to have at least half an hour of discussion because I have about 15 minutes worth of questions. <laughs> Sorry, you know, because this is a talk I never gave before, I didn't know how long it's going to take. So I see it took exactly one hour, so I, I'm, I apologize. Do I look stressed? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only thing is that you know, they put out the coffee and, and the food and it might disappear later, so let's grab it, come back, and keep going. <laughs> Stream on YouTube. Yep. Mm -hmm. A co tam připojí nějaké lidi? Asi čtyři. Mm -hmm. Předpokládám, že tam někdo z jako nádobí a borky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jsme to posílkali a pár lidí, mm -hmm. se nám o to zajímají. Mm -hmm. Super. Bude tam i záznam teda ponechaný, takže to můžete klidně v laborce ostatně <laughs> předat. A případně mám i záznamy, i to nahrávám na počítače, takže kdyby se s tím něco
experiment, co on za krátky představil v tom dánsku. To bylo zorganizovaný, to je úplně jako... Ty jo, ale je to šílený, prostě. <laughs> ale přijde mi, že těch podmínek tam bylo jako tolik, že to zkreslí ty výstupy, no, ale jako ta organizace... <laughs> <laughs> jako byl by to zázrak, kdyby to vyšlo, no prostě, jako, že, jo, že ten proces možná i jako funguje ve skutečnosti, ale jako změřit to prostě, to je, to jako je fakt, držím palce, aby to vyšlo, ale mo, moc tomu nevěřím, aby bylo upřímnej. Ale bylo to hrozně zajímavý krát, myslím, že nám se nikdy nepovedlo jako udělat věci tak precizně, jako organizovat mnoho tolik a to bylo teda, to bylo vynikající práce. Hmm. Musím smaknout. Jo, a jako je to přesně ten krok, který jako bychom chtěli ideálně udělat jako směrem k té komplexitě, že? Jako, že vždycky v té laboratoři prostě manipulujeme nějaký mechanismy, které jsou tak daleko od toho skutečného světa. A teďka prostě on řekne taky, pojďme ale začít skládat dohromady a manipulovat tu, tu skládanku. No, jenže to už jako je pak strašně vlastně těžký přesně z toho jako praktického organizačního hlediska. No. I think that if people are coming back, uh, we can start with this discussion. So you have also time to get something to eat. No, yeah, I'm fine. I had yeah. breakfast before. That's just uh, if uh, someone wants to ask a question, please use the microphone so we hear it in in the video as well. <laughs> I'm just going to ask this because we were talking about it in the coffee line. How do you get over the data analysis problem? So mm -hmm. every time I have thought about using any of these measures, I've looked at what I actually get out of them and go, I don't, I can't do this. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm pretty good at data analysis. And I just think, like, how do you make that step to looking at, you know, messy heart rate data and going, like, I can understand this and actually analyze this data in some way I'm confident I'm not massively right. messing up? Right, yeah, that's, uh, it's a big concern and, uh, well, the way to do it is uh, to look at like, previous approaches, right? So uh, other, like, people who are actually physiologists and um, the thing is that, like, these devices, you know, like, when the companies come up with them, it has a lot of um, uh, test runs and there is a lot of validation going on, you know, similar to our psychological measures. So. Uh, so, and they also validate it, you know, the, uh, in comparison to with other similar devices. So, so if you look at these validation procedures, it's one way to start understanding the data and what may be the problems in the data. <coughs> but there are also like uh, known problems, let's say in heart rate data. Like we know that there are some ectopic beats, and we know uh, how to find them. You know, but 
then it's like we know generally how to find them, but whether we would say that you know the, the if the bead is 85% larger than the previous one, it's ectopic, or if it's 80% larger than it's ectopic, that, that's the parameter setup that I talked about. And you know, so and you know, there are whole fields like biological psychology that deals with this. And you know, you have recommendations that and you have guidelines, so you can use those. Uh, but it's up to you eventually what uh, type of parameters you use to set this up. So, so there is a lot of learning, and uh, for me, it helped that. Whenever I try to use a new measure, I usually try to collaborate with someone who, is, who has been using it. And then, you know, I feel more confident in subsequent studies using it myself. So what you're telling me is that if I want to do this, I should just come and talk to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for this. This sounds like a great solution. <laughs> uh, yes, although um, I would hope that you will find even someone more proficient. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, it's also one thing I didn't mention, and I perhaps should. It's a lot of work, like data cleaning. It's just time-consuming work because sometimes, depending on the measure, it's also computationally very demanding. And so I think I was telling John yesterday that, like, the the way I um, dealt with when my first son was born, and also my my daughter when they were born, like you know, it's difficult to work around these days. Uh, so I'd usually use, <laughs> my main task would be actually analysis of this type of data because you know you can set up some uh, parameters and some data cleaning procedures and then it just runs for you know hours and then you can just check on it once in a while and you are still working, you are still you know doing this and, uh, and you are efficient while taking care of your baby. So, so yeah, it's also time consuming. And uh, it also entails, so you can do those things manually, so you know, like, and you should, you should go uh, through each of the uh, recording signal you have manually, visually to look at that. Uh, but then, you know, like, you also want to have a lot of participants. So like in our recent paper that just came out uh, on, on ritualization and anxiety, we have, I think, 250 people. And you know, checking the, the signal for each of them manually, it's, I mean, I think it took like two weeks of my time, just mm -hmm. that, and then you, you know, and then you also have to learn, usually each of the software has their own ways to do that, and uh, you need some uh, type of like um, programming language to use from the, for that specific software, so, so all of that, it's really, takes a lot of time. So again, I guess the advice is the same. Just <laughs> find someone else who will do it, but not me because it takes a lot of time. <laughs> now, I, I would be happy to talk about it more. I mean, if you would like to know about some other measure, we can discuss that. I think I have a similar question, but... Um, Thank you. I think I have a similar question, but um, it, it comes from... So, okay, so I think the context is... Uh, sorry, so I had... Ba my, my baby was born, and then you know we went to doctors a lot, etc. And then I observed the way that medical professionals use physiological measures, right? So here are two observations. Um, one was, uh, well, so one was like I was trying to figure out like how do I take the temperature of my baby, mm, right? Mm. And so I did like a deep dive into the literature on uh, on thermometers, right? So like rectal, oral, like you know ear based, etc. And the literature is extremely messy. Right, like no one seems to know whether or not any of these devices are accurate, and also how to compare them against each other. So that immediately filled me with like pessimism about mm, mm, like about mm. thermometers, right? So that was, that was one bit of information I found a bit worrying. And then the other thing was when my wife was in the hospital after the baby was born, and they would take her heart rate or whatever, uh, and, and and like and this particular thing happened a lot, which was they would take the heart rate. Or the blood pressure, and they go, oh, "Well, that's not right, right? That can't be right." So they look at the number, and well, that can't be right. Let's do it again, right? And then they, they kind of like did it until they, they thought they got the right number. But I don't know what like they were basing that intuition on, right? Because it, 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 it was just obvious to them that the, the data was wrong, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, but that also filled me with like pessimism about what the hell these machines are doing, and like whether or not any of these people know how to use them. And these these are these are doctors, right? These are medical professionals. So, it, like that's that sort of phenomenon makes me worry about whether or not we actually do know what these devices are doing and how to calibrate mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. how to validate them. I mean, like, mm -hmm. how much of this kind of problem do you see in, in the physiological measures that 
you use mm -hmm. in terms of like validating in situ, right? Like not mm -hmm. not like the kind of like validation studies that they have already run on the devices, but but calibration when you're when you're there on site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this is a. Uh, 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 I, I guess it's my answer is somewhere in the middle of your two questions, um, which is, it's calibration is issue by itself, and um, also I have to say, and I didn't say that again, my fault. We do lose the data, a lot, lot of data. Like I would say, ten percent of participants, it's normal to lose during recording mistakes uh, because of recording mistakes, because of the, the devices didn't fit or it slipped, you know, and. So, so like we, in Mauritius, we had a problem uh, that uh, we use these uh, heart rate monitors which are strapped around the chest. Th they are used, or produced mostly for people in sports and you know, and we had these, these tiny Mauritian women and it just like, <laughs> we just, you know, like, like this. And um, not to mention that, you know, you, like uh, they would have all these saris, uh, like all these garments, so you'd have, to, like we would have to have special, of course, like female research assistants, you know, putting them on, stripping them on. So yeah, so so there is a lot of these prob like practical problems that um, you need to you need to make sure that uh, if you strap a participant, that you, it actually measures something meaningful. It, there's as um, low portion of noise as possible, and there are procedures to do that. <coughs> In your example with the doctors and that actually the general concern. Um, I agree, although, uh, you know, I think that at least for the devices I use, we do have pretty good correlations or like validations with other measures that I'm confident that it work. Like what type of inferences you can do from that, that's, that's a separate issue. And I, I think we are still like fighting on that front and we don't know much. But on the actual, like um, taking the actual measurements, I think it's pretty stable. Like the, 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 I, I would believe those devices. That, that's that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, and so, but on site, like if you mm -hmm. gave them two devices, right, simultaneously, do they tend to show the same yeah. number? Okay, well yeah. that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is this is usually what we try to do also in, in pilot testing, mm -hmm. um, and what we do also like. For example, with these uh, sociometric badges that's, you know, that measure social proximity and things like that. Uh, that was a difficult uh, gadget to work with because it was pretty novel and it was just a prototype. So we would do a bunch of testing, like simulating different situations and then actually looking into the data if we can you know, find what we expect to find there. So like, there was a lot of validation like that. And, and it seemed to work, so you know that, that increased my confidence in the measurements. But, um, but yes, yes. I mean, there is a concern about that. So, like I said earlier on, I've got about 15 minutes worth of questions for you. So perhaps I'll not bother asking all of them. Um, first of all, with regards to computing time, mm -hmm. uh, if you have tasks that are computer, uh, computing heavy, come and talk to me because we've got a pretty powerful machine in Białystok that can potentially help you out. All right, so that might save you some mm. time. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing because it might mean that you won't be able to <laughs> sit, sit and take care of the baby, right? <laughs> so th that's one thing. But um, listening to your talk, I kind of got this image that, you know, of the relationship between physiological me measures, behavioral measures, and sort of fairly traditional pen and paper mm. measures. Mm. And when it comes to the study of supernatural beliefs, that when you're using pen and paper measures, it's pretty clear cut what you're talking about when you mean beliefs, right? It's propositional, it's, it's everything that John uh, mm -hmm. was talking about mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're really worried about people lying, you know, people responding in a way that they think is socially desirable, and yada, 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 right? Then you get to behavioral measures, and it's not as clear what you could possibly mean by beliefs there and how that is a measure of belief, but you're a little bit less worried about people lying and the socially desirable stuff, right? Then you get to the physiological stuff and you're the least worried about that. I mean, there are still issues, as you pointed out, of course, 
right? But what beliefs are, mm. how this is about beliefs, that seems to like disappear like a cloud once you get too close to it, right? Um, so clearly you're not, so you think that's a fair, a fair yeah, idea. Totally, yeah. and that's why I study rituals, not beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, all right, so let me ask a question on the basis of that. How much sense does it make to you to study religion without looking at supernatural beliefs? Mm -hmm. In other words, to put it a different way, to what degree the stuff that you do relies on and requires, for example, also the pa pen and paper stuff and just the re really straightforward behavioral stuff? Yeah, um, it, re it requires it, uh, and that's and we use it a lot. And so there are two answers I have to give. Uh, first, more practical one, and I think I mentioned this during my talk. Like whenever you try to use some of this device, and this was uh, an advice that I was given by neuroscientists when you know during my early years, I of course wanted to put pe people into scanners, and he was like. Look, first try to ask your question with pen and paper because it's cheap <laughs> and it's fast and just do it and it's gonna show you if it makes sense to go further and, and I, I try to keep to that advice because I think it's very good advice. Uh, so pen and paper is always um, a good start. Um, uh, but what was the second answer I wanted to give? Oh yeah, that relates to our race race discussion. Because, uh, and I hope this, this, it's apparent from my talk now, is that I don't believe that you know, we should necessarily find, <coughs> like, on the face value, correspondence between these, dif these like, different levels of measurements. Mm -hmm. Because the higher the level of measurements, the more, like, factors or mechanisms or whatever your components, whatever you want to call it, are coming in to, you know, like, uh, to produce this, this measurement that you actually see. Uh, so it doesn't make sense that there will be, like, exact correspondence. I mean, you hope that it will be and it's all, all going to make sense because you selected the most important factor that drives this effect across these levels, great. But this is not, of course, often happening and then you have the problem with that, uh, measurement error. So, you know, at, like you have, can have different measurement error at different levels, which can explain the discrepancy. But then it also can lead to interesting questions. So if you know that there is no measurement error, you hope there is no measurement error, it can then make you ask, so why we do see this discrepancy? Maybe I got like the system and its components, I got it wrong. It doesn't work that way. Maybe I need to add another component and try to do it this way. And that's why I think the systemic thing is really helpful here. So, you know, so if you see, so I would say, whenever possible, always try to get all these levels of measurements and try to compare them because it can produce new questions. In our uh, studies on anxiety, you know, we of course measure uh, self-report. So we ask people, <laughs> do you feel anxious? And uh, fortunately, there we do see correspondence mostly, not always, but mostly between what people say and uh, the physiological measures. So, that, that, so, so yeah, so I think it makes sense. And then a third point um, is uh, related to our study of type some Kavadi, is that also, at what level of our measurement do we expect the effects to manifest? So, uh, hopefully, if you are measuring things like anxiety, and you know we think that, let's say, ritual decreases anxiety, so you know, and that should be beneficial for the participants, then we would assume, while well, we would really like to measure this at the physiological level and see that if there are any benefits, those benefits should be at the physiological level to to be like manifested, <coughs> but. You know, they may work also not through the physiological level, but through you know, uh, procedure like processes like placebo effects. Yeah. You know, so so I believe that the, those rituals are helping me. I feel better, as we saw in the data. Well, I didn't show you the graphs, but we saw in the data. And then this this effect can drive change on the physiological level afterwards, right? So, so it's also um, important to consider this. I have a related question. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is this has to do with the relationship between physiological measures and implicit measures, right? So like I sort of wish Will was here. Um, so there's a this idea that one of the scandals uh, of implicit measurement is that there seems to be 
a very weak or no correlation with explicit measures. But then I agree with you that, like, why would you expect that, given that you might think that, you know, the discrepancy is, is the interesting thing. Mm. So, like, that's fine. Mm. What is actually the bigger scandal in implicit measurement is that the implicit measures don't correlate with each other. Right, and and then now we have a problem, right? It's like, you know, the theory is supposed to be that there are two levels of things going on, right? There's the implicit stuff, the explicit mm -hmm. stuff. So you would think that the implicit measures would correlate with each other, given the same attitude target, and they don't. And and now we're not sure what the hell's going on. So what's the analogy with the physiological measures? Would you expect that different physiological me measures correlate with each other, or 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 maybe that, or maybe that's not the expectation because these are different things and different processes altogether? Yeah. Or like what? Or, or are there any non-physiological measures that you would expect physiological measures to correlate with that are not self-report measures? Well, I'm not sure about the last question, to be honest. But um, I can try to answer the question before. Um, so, uh, in measures of anxiety, um, I mean. Yes, it's true that uh, these different physiological measures measure different processes in our body. So you don't need to expect that they should necessarily correlate. But at some point, like, uh, you know, these systems are connected. So <coughs> when we measure anxiety, we, could, we used in, in our past either the heart rate variability measure or the galvanic skin response measure. And those tap into two a bit different physiological processes. Uh, but what I find is that they do correlate as, as we would expect. So, you know, not perfectly because they shouldn't you know, correlate perfectly, but they do. So this is again, um, yeah, like the criterion validity uh, that it seems like when it, they should agree, they do agree. At least, you know, in these two particular measures. I don't, I don't think I try this with other measures though. And, and uh, I think mostly it shouldn't be the case um, that, that the measures should agree. Like you usually want to have a separate measure for a separate process that doesn't need to be uh, associated with you know the other processes that you measure. And like in the in the data analysis, is it possible to extract like the anxiety component of the GSR no, measure no, or the measure? No. So that that's 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 uh, the translation of the measure into the higher levels, uh, and that's that's like the frontier that is highly debated. Uh, which is uh, like maybe let's talk just about heart rate. It's a bit easier, you know. Like you measure people have increased heart rate during your experiment. Like what does it mean? Like they moved. Uh, it's a physiological, physiological, physiological activity. Physical activity. It's also arousal. Is it positive or negative arousal? You know. So so with heart rate variability, some people claim that you know there are like different frequencies that you can analyze, like high frequency versus low frequency, to tap into either positive or negative arousal. I don't trust that too much yet, uh, but there are definitely attempts. But look at what level we are talking about, positive or negative arousal. That, that's the most precision that you can get, and it's very low. So, you know, so in our anxiety experiments, well, you know, I'm pretty sure that I'm measuring some negative effect because I produce this negative, I cause this negative effect. So it's fine, you know, it makes sense. But, uh, but uh, like in the real world, like that's, that's much more complicated. Right. What, like what, by, what, what is the magnitude of the correlation usually between GSR and HRV? Well, I, uh, I, to be honest, I would just be making stuff up. So I'm not. I don't know. Like, yeah. I, I don't know from the top of my head. All right. Other questions, please. No. In that case, I'm going to ask one last question. <laughs> okay. Right, sorry. <laughs> I was just leaving. <laughs> okay. Um, this might be a little bit out of left field, but I'm just wondering, the three-dimensional cube, yeah. well, cubes mostly yeah. are three-dimensional, yeah. um, uh, that you have, I was wondering if you've ever thought about the relationship between that way of representing things and Tinbergen's four questions. Yes. Yes. Go for it. Yes. Tell me about it. So, um, <laughs> it's motivated by Tinbergen. And so, like, the two basic dimensions, uh, which would be the temporal dimension, right? So it's like the like, question why we have mm -hmm. things. And then you have the mechanistic action. So how do they actually work? I thought so. Yeah. So, like, that, that, that's our main motivation. But what you are trying to add to that is the context gotcha. and why it should be different, these two dimensions, why it should be different in different contexts. Uh, so that's like the third added dimension that should bring in the humanities. All right. Um, 
Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it's really, um, you know, what you are suggesting in a way, you know, it's like a, this naive attempts for conciliance in sciences, and, you know, we know from Wilson that it doesn't really work that way and so on. Uh, so it, it's a bit naive. That's why I'm saying it's like a thinking tool, because in a way what you can end up with, you can say, well, but, you know, this 3D cube that we uh, designed, it should apply to all sciences, and everyone should think like that, and I don't think that's true. I just think it may be useful to use it. You know, when you when you think about the phenomenon that you study, like where does it, like where are you on this cube, and what can you really tell from the type of data that you have, and what, more importantly, like what type of other data you need. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's where we are getting at this like multiple mixed methods. Awesome. And Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Ich komme jetzt zu Silberbeeren.